All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with chapter six. And here we are talking about extensional settings. Here again, the overview of the most important extensional settings, starting with intracontinental rifts, mid-oceanic ridges, and passive margins, which are related to the breakup of continents. Uh, continental back arc basins, which are rift-like structures, but uh, related to subduction nearby, along an Andean type uh, active plate margin. And uh, it's similar equivalent with intraoceanic back arc extension, which forms island arcs. Uh, related to uh, rifting and continental breakup are also uh, olacogens, and we are going to talk about olacogens in, uh, in some detail. Continental breakup currently is most prominently developed in the Red Sea, a far rift zone with a large uh, plume head in this area here. And we all know that the East African Rift is uh, related to these structures that form here the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. So let's talk a little bit about these kind of processes. Such plume control continental breakup is uh, always related to such triple point junctions. Typically, two of these junctions of these uh, arms that make up the triple point will develop to oceanic lithosphere, to oceanic basins. And uh, that is also the case here in uh, the Afar with the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea, both starting to develop new oceanic lithosphere. The third arm here into the East African Rift is not quite at that stage. Some triple points develop three active arms and three proper oceanic rift zones and mid-oceanic ridges. Most of them only have two, and the other one becomes a failed rift. That would be an olacogen, which we are going to cover a little bit later. For the East African Rift, it is unclear whether it will become an olacogen or a proper oceanic basin. Looking into the uh, African environment, we see there are a number of extensional centers. Some of them have been active in the past, other, others are currently active, and we see here uh, also the relation between such uh, active uh, breakup tendencies and extensional tectonics and topographic highs. Uh, we see uh, rift zones here as dashed lines, as gray dashed lines, so that have to, have to do with the Karoo rifting. And we see here Phanerozoic and recent plume heads indicated in uh, large circular patterns. Currently active is the Gulf of Aden and Afa Triangle a plume. We see here the Limpopo Le Bombo Savi Junction, which also is fairly young, Tristan da Cunha and Benue are related to the breakup of southern Gondwana forming the Atlantic. And of course, there are older rifts uh, and even Archean Proterozoic uh, areas, where we now find in the geological record evidence of fossil plume heads. Looking at the East African rift zone, we see that the uh, rifting in East Africa is geometrically not simple. We have an eastern and a western rift arm. We see here the western rift arm goes through Lake Tanganyika, Lake Kivu, Lake Albert here into the direction of uh, the Nile, the continuation further into Sudan and uh, Egypt. And uh, here we see the uh, eastern rift arm which is related to the major volcanic mountains, Mount Kenya and Mount Kilimanjaro, which uh, carries on and they finally uh, meet each other here north of Lake Nyasa. Looking at the situation in uh, Ethiopia with the Afa plume, we see that a large igneous province with flood basalts is related to the uh, rise of that plume and to continental breakup. Everything you see here in these uh, greenish colors are highland areas, and uh, that is where we essentially find the flood basalts related to this plume activity. The triple point would be somewhere here in the Afar Depression in northern Ethiopia. Looking from space uh, southward, we see here the Afar Triangle continuing into the East African Rift further south. Uh, beautiful, uh, I think a space shuttle uh, view is that from the 80s. On the ground in uh, the 
In Ethiopia, in the Alpha Depression, we find signs of uh, active extensional tectonics. It's an arid area, as you can see, with a little water activity, and that means uh, geological structures remain better preserved than in uh, humid or in tropical areas. Here we see such fissures that are related to extensional tectonics, and they can become fairly large. You see here people for scale, uh, very deep extensional fissures that are related to very young extensional tectonics. Here we see that at a smaller scale, and here we see also a very typical feature of this slumping of a former horizontal surface. And you see here the slumping is directed to the left-hand side, and here we see a shallow dip to the eastern side. So uh, these block rotations, they can happen bilaterally in such an ongoing extensional fault. How does that uh, look in 3D? The locals are familiar with these things. You see here these block rotations along Listric Falls with a rollover anticline that we see here during extensional tectonics. Here's a range of uh, upper crustal structures related to extensional tectonics. Horst and Graven tectonics are the uh, most commonly known ones with conjugated normal faults you see here falls that are dipping in opposite direction and show a opposite transport sense, top to the left here, top to the right over here. And as you know, meanwhile, this means that uh, sigma 1 is directed vertically and sigma 3 and sigma 2 operate horizontal. That is the stress field that would belong to such extensional structures. If you have Listric block rotation like here, you have more kind of a simple shear geometry and the listric curvature of such falls uh, usually uh, rotates such blocks in a basin and range. Geometry, we see that in the United States as the famous basin and range province. This province is related to these kinds of extensional tectonics. Listric falls curving downwards and usually merge in a major master fault, it's also called a detachment fault, which uh, can be very shallowly oriented. Other than these bilateral gravens that we see here as the result of conjugated uh, normal faults, we find here half graven structures. Half graven structures uh, show these listric faults with a much more significant displacement here on one side and a less significant uh, displacement in opposite direction on the other side of such large extensional structures as we see them here. Here are various other ways how extensional tectonics can be manifested. Most of them are related to uh, listric detachment faults, but sometimes we have planar faults associated with them, which produces these kinds of tilted block faults that we see here, bookshelf faults. They are sometimes called. There is a breakaway where the whole staggered set of tilted blocks starts. And uh, then you have this typical layer tilting that you can see in the field and that we also are seeing here in this example. These tiltings here are related to uh, probably listric faults underneath, but uh, we cannot decide here from this figure whether we also might have such a bookshelf faults with planar fault plane. Obviously, some space is created here, and that is very textbook-like and uh, theoretical. These gaps would not exist in nature. They have to be filled by smaller fragmentation or at the bottom of such tilted faults. These listric faults and these uh, tilted fault blocks, fault blocks associated with them we have seen before. Important is this rollover anticline that is associated with listric faulting. So you would form here something that looks like a fold, but is not really a buckle fold, not a tectonic fold. It's just a bending of the upper block. And this upper block needs to bend because otherwise you would create such a uh, acute uh, pointy gap, which nature doesn't support. Obviously, gravity would make here uh, this area just dropping down and that would form then the rollover anticline. Structures can be a little bit more complicated, and uh, very often, even in listric environments, you have faults here, curving listric faults, with antithetic and synthetic faults. Again, the synthetic nature means that along such a fault plane here, we have a steeper orientation, but the same 
hanging wall movement as we have here along the detachment fault. These here would be antithetic faults because here the hanging wall movement is a top to the left opposite to the top to the right sense of shear of our detachment fault in this example. Extensional duplexes can occur. We have been talking about duplex structures in the uh, 202 course and we also have mentioned extensional duplexes uh, here again a reminder. This is how they form. These are duplex structures. Duplex structures are structures that are surrounded on all sides by tectonic boundaries such as these here and uh, here the hanging wall block is always moving to the right hand side. Don't mistake these geometries here for an SC fabric because then you would assume top to the left movement. These are extensional duplexes. They look very similar. But again, in uh, the field, you will have to study the nature of the fault surface and determine the, shear, the shear sense and the shear direction accurately. That will allow you to identify such extensional duplexes. Uh, these kinds of structures are very important to know for all supracrustal ore deposits and specifically hydrocarbon deposits because abundant faults like that easily might form traps where you can form deposits of uh, gas or of oil. Here we see possible end member types and one hybrid model of continental breakup. Continental breakup and extensional tectonics in continental lithosphere can happen in uh, different modes. Uh, we see here a pure shear and a simple shear mode. We see a delamination model and we see a hybrid model. We are going to talk about all these uh, different types here uh, one by one, but uh, let's point out what the bottom three have in common. The bottom three here have a transcrustal or even translithospheric extensional shear zone, such a large detachment zone. That is missing here in the pure shear model. Also here is a large detachment fault in the uh, middle crust, usually at the bottom of the brittle crust, but this does not transect the whole lithosphere or at least the whole crust as we see here in the three examples at the bottom. Let's have a look at the pure shear McKenzie model. Here we find a detachment fault along the interface between the brittle and the ductile crust here in this level and we find bilateral conjugated faulting on either side of such a rifting system. There is a penetrative ductile shearing in the lower crust. You see here these structures indicate ductile failure and horizontal uh, extensional shear zones that uh, translate these blocks apart from each other. In the upper crust we find extensional block faulting and these detachment faults by brittle failure and we observe a wide zone of crustal and lithospheric thinning. You see here thinning affects a wide area in our rifting system and the thinning of this lithosphere of this crust specifically uh, happens underneath the area where we would find the rift basin. So this is an important feature of the pure shear McKenzie model. Let's have a look at the so-called Wernicke model, which is a simple shear model. There are a few important differences. We also see here brittle failure in the upper crust with listric block rotation and the formation of a detachment fault, but here this shear zone transects the whole crust and uh, usually even uh, the whole lithosphere at advanced stages of crustal and lithospheric extension. Again, the block rotation here is fairly similar, like in the McKenzie model, but here the polarity is uniform. We do not find significant uh, conjugated block rotation and faulting uh, with, uh, in this example here, top to the left sense of shear. It's uniform top to the right sense of shear. That is the simple shear nature of the Wernicke model. This uniform block rotation forms half gravens rather than gravens and horse structures and uh, we would fill these gaps in between these rotating blocks usually with the young syn kinematic sediments, with syn tectonic sediments. Important is here that we are thinning the lithosphere under the upper plate's rift shoulder. We are not thinning the lithosphere in the area where we find the basin and range at the surface. Here the 
crust is still and the lithosphere is fairly thick. The thinnest part of the lithosphere here is laterally shifted from the area where at the surface we find the half grafts. The delamination model is a variety of the simple shear model with uh, one difference. We see a large sub-horizontal detachment fault that extends laterally away from the area where we find the block rotation and the sedimentary basins forming at the surface. So here is a long, long area where at the surface we would not observe the fact that we are actually in a zone or above a zone of crustal extension. Half grams are also there, like in the uh, simple shear Wernicke model, but we see the thinning of the lithosphere pretty far away from the rift basin. This has some implications for the localization of volcanic activity because here where you upwell the asthenospheric mantle, that is where you would probably produce a uh, volcanic uh, field. This can be a large-scale volcanic activity leading to plateau basalts. It can be something uh, more linear and uh, localized, but we will not observe volcanic activity or significant volcanic activity in the sedimentary extensional basin. Here now, like uh, always in geology, you can um, observe some sort of mixing of end member types. And uh, here we see a combination of crustal detachment with a more penetrative shearing here, like in the McKenzie model. This is ductile failure here. Over an area, a wider area of mantle upwelling, and a unilateral simple shear rifting with listric folds uh, with a uniform uh, top to the right-hand side transport in this example with uh, only insignificant top to the left graben features here. This leads to a wider zone of early asthenospheric uplift uh, other than in the simple shear models. In the simple shear models this area would have been much smaller as we can see here in, in this example or also in this example. That also has implications for heat transfer. Here we would uh, heat up the crust in a wider area and that then would promote further ductile shearing because our geothermal gradient in this area would be much higher than in the simple shear models that we have seen. Here in this hybrid model we will have a large zone of uh, heat influx and this will uh, accelerate ductile failure here in this region and probably here the simple shear part uh, on the left-hand side will become less and less active and uh, crustal failure will occur essentially in the hotter parts in this area according to pure shear strain, uh, according to the McKenzie model. Here's an overview of uh, different kinds of uh, crustal failure. The different models actually just plotted together in a large block diagram. This can happen in this way also in nature. You might have along a uh, continental rift domains that uh, follow rather the pure shear model, like in this area here, or a more uniform simple shear model, like uh, in this area here where we have, or in this area where we have uniform uh, hanging wall transport and produce half gravens rather than these bilateral types of failures. And if you change from mon one mode laterally into another, what you have to have is a separating tectonic boundary. These are transfer faults, along of which we will find strike-slip movements. Let's have a look at a few real-life cross-sections. Uh, one example here from from Europe, from the North Sea. This is an area that is very well known due to uh, hydrocarbon exploration. Most of uh, Great Britain's and Norway's uh, hydrocarbon resources are sitting in these kinds of structures in the North Sea, somewhere in this area here. And that is where we find, for instance, the Viking Graben. And uh, here in the cross-section you see the typical characteristics of extensional tectonics with host and Graben features that thin out the crust and on top you fill up the uh, sedimentary basins with uh, first syntectonic, and uh, pre-tectonic sediments uh, and following then uniform, not yet faulted, uh, younger sediments on top. 
At the northeastern end of the Red Sea, we find here the uh, Gulf of Suez and uh, the Sinai. And here this cross-section is located in this area. Here you see a different type of crustal extension, essentially listric fold block rotation with uh, tilting of one's uh, horizontal layers. And uh, the half graben basins are filled with younger sediments that you see here. These are recent and Miocene sediments, essentially. They overlie Precambrian basements that, that you see here at the bottom. But again, the hallmarks of extensional tectonics are pretty clearly visible in this cross-section. Let's stay with the Red Sea Rift for a while. We see here a series of sketches that illustrate what actually happens during a Red Sea-type continental breakup. And uh, we go through all these uh, little sketches here one by one. It's very schematic, but uh, in principle we can see that continental breakup according to the Red Sea uh, failure type. It starts with a transtensional rifting that usually lasts only a few million years, maybe a few tens million of years, and it evolves either into an aborted intracontinental rift or aulacogen, an intracontinental basin, or it might form a new oceanic basin with complete disruption of continental lithosphere. At this first phase, we do not know what will happen out of these different options, and uh, but locally the extension might be fairly in intense with uh, 10 to 20 percent of crustal extension, but we do not yet have a through-going rift system. Locally we might actually uh, associate this uh, event or this early stage with some synrift volcanism, provided that there is a heat source such as a plume not too far from the bottom of the lithosphere. After a few million years, a lithospheric breakup goes into uh, the next stage. And here, in this case, we are following essentially the Wernicke model with a simple shear. We will find here a more through-going comprehensive uh, graben system, half graben system at the surface with uh, the initial breakaway, that is the initial boundary of the rift graben system. And we see here this long inclined extensional fold that transects the whole crust and goes even to the bottom of the lithosphere. The hanging wall plate, the upper plate, is undergoing a strong heating because you see here at this point where there's this inclined normal fold, ductile shear zone in the lower parts of the crust and lithosphere, will hit the asthenosphere. That is where we get the most intense mantle upwelling and decompression melting will form a field of plateau basalts at the surface with the intense heat influx that warms up the upper plate on uh, a little bit away from the rift shoulder. So again here the intense heat influx is not seen right where we find the uh, rift graben basins. We find the heat influx and the upwelling of the mantle laterally away from it due to the inclination of our large-scale extensional fault. Thermal rise is the consequence of heat influx and magma throughput into the uh, plateau basalt fields at the surface. There is a slightly older fossil example in Africa of such a shifting of a volcanic line away from an extensional basin. Here in uh, Central Africa, uh, the Cameroon volcanic line is offset of the Benue Rift. Benue is here. The Benue is one of the major rivers here in Africa. Joins the Niger here, and uh, we find here Nigeria. Here is Cameroon. The vo Cameroon volcanic line trends here to the northeast, and uh, that is a couple of hundred kilometers away from the uh, actual Benue Rift basin. In the Benue Rift Basin, we uh, have a little bit of a more complication because in addition to the extensional tectonics, we have some strike-slip component leading to oblique slip faulting in the Benue Rift. This structural map here illustrates it. Going back to the Red Sea Rifting in the following stage, so some 20 million years after the initiation of the rift, we will find that the continental man mantle is denuded. It comes to the surface here at this place. At the uh, 
lateral end of the uh, rift basin with our uh, with our now fairly shallowly oriented individual rotated folded blocks we find here the asthenospheric is coming to the surface unfortunately we never see that because at this stage this area is already flooded you see here this uh, light blue line that indicates the normal sea level at this stage you might even find the lower plates rift shoulder is already subsided below sea level and of course here such asthenospheric mantle by that time would be covered by young sediments that are deposited into such a rift basin we see here that the continental lithospheric mantle is broken apart already this initially connected continental lithospheric mantle that we see here in this pale orange was connected once to this lithospheric mantle underneath the upper plate upper plate's rift shoulder and uh, what we see here this connection is destroyed the asthenosphere is, is coming right to the bottom of the crust that is still not entirely disrupted here in the upper plate's rift shoulder of course you will have massive outpouring of basaltic lava in this area lots of dikes sheeted dikes are starting to form in this uh, leftover piece of continental crust on top of the upwelling asthenospheric mantle new asthenospheric mantle is forming here in this area because if you transport laterally away the upper plate you will have here uh, asthenospheric mantle that is cooling down and as soon as asthenospheric mantle is cooling down to the temperature of 1280 degrees or less you call it lithospheric mantle that is the only difference apart from some geochemical variations of course but mechanically the difference between lithospheric mantle and asthenospheric mantle is this temperature range this temperature defines the boundary between asthenospheric and lithospheric mantle at the surface we find rim basins you see here in this area where the continental crust is uh, cooling down and if it cools down it increases in density and this leads to subsidence this is a situation when rim basins would form also here you might have transgression you might have um, marine or uh, continental um, continental sedimentary basins the subsidence occurs and the cooling occurs because we have moved here this area away from the heat source this part of the continent of the upper plate uh, once was located here on top of the heat source now it is away from it that means lack of heat influx leads to cooling cooling leads to subsidence also here in the uh, continental shelf of the lower plate we will find subsidence also here this part has moved now away from this heat source and uh, this will uh, contribute to the already ongoing cooling and will promote transgression of marine water and the associated sedimentary marine basins will fill up the remaining topographic relief that is uh, left over from the block rotation in the early stages of continental breakup finally then we will uh, disrupt the last bits of the upper plates crust in this area and we will start forming a mid-oceanic ridge new oceanic lithosphere is starting to form mafic material basaltic material you know all that from earlier courses large-scale flooding is now observed on the lower plates shelf and also the upper plates shelf will increasingly start to subside the last stage now is the evolution of passive margins on either side on the upper plate and on the lower plate and uh, the uh, flooding will continue to, to take place even these formerly fairly highly elevated drift shoulders are now below the sea level and uh, younger sediments will cover the topography that was uh, created by block rotation by normal faulting during continental breakup stable passive margins develop such passive margins as we find them now on the South American East Coast or the Southern African West Coast. What happens to the third arm, to the third arm of triple point junctions, uh, such as, for instance, the current East African Rift, which is the third arm that has not or not yet developed uh, oceanic crust 
out of the AFA triple point. We do not know what the future of the East African Rift might be, but uh, normally we will find that such a, such a third arm will not go further to continental breakup and to the formation of new oceanic lithosphere. Uh, this uh, term olacogen for such failed rifts comes from a Greek term olax, which means trough, failed rifts. These are large-scale, fairly linear extensional structures that are always associated with continental margins or former continental margins. So in the fossil situation, of course, this continental margin can be overprinted by a later continent-continent collision. What we still would see in the fossil geological record are the olacogens sticking out of such collision zones at high angle. We will see uh, how that looks like in real life in uh, one or two slides further down. Olacogens are oriented at high angle, about 120 degrees, to rifts or to passive, passive plate margins, and they start from former triple points from plume head positions. Here this shows it very schematically. Here you see an array of uh, mantle plumes that get connected. Always two arms of such two plume heads of such two triple points will join and then form a continuous continental breakup zone. Uh, the third one is uh, sticking out somehow useless into the cratonic margins on either side. Here we see on the left-hand side how that develops. You see here a new oceanic basin forming with this typical uh, offset of the mid-oceanic ridge. And uh, we see here on the neighboring continental margins uh, on either side of the ocean the triple points that form pale drifts into the continents. At the surface, such extensional features obviously will be exploited by large rivers, and uh, rivers will follow them to the oceanic basin. Let's compare the evolution of plate margins of rifts that lead to continental breakup and form oceanic basins uh, with olacogens. Here, two columns, plate margins in their evolution on the left-hand side, olacogens on the right-hand side. Initially, the geometry and the situation is, is very similar to each other. It's, in fact, identical. At this stage, it's not yet decided which of the three arms of such a triple point will develop to oceanic lithosphere and which will become an olacogen. In the further evolution, then, we see here the entire disruption of the continental lithosphere in uh, the case of continental breakup, this would be the Red Sea stage. Here we see that this stage is not reached. No disruption of lithosphere during rifting, but we do see substantial subsidence and sediment deposition in these gravens and half gravens. Finally, extensional tectonics will stop. We will uh, slowly lose the heat source because a passive continental margin is develop developing along two arms of the triple point junction. The third one, the aulacogen, will uh, start to be filled up with sediment and uh, slowly we'll see that this mantle upwelling here will uh, be eliminated by subsidence. This is what we see here in the next stage. We see a completely flat moho and further subsidence on the uh, surface with shallow sedimentary basin. At the same time, along the continental margin, we might have reached the stage of closure of this ocean by subduction. We see here another continent is coming along and is uh, consuming and destroying the oceanic lithosphere. And finally, we will find a continent collision zone along such a former passive margin. The olacogen under such uh, contractional tectonics might undergo faulting and folding because here we have a uh, fairly thick sequence of uh, young and often unconsolidated sediments. This would be a preferred area for intracratonic deformation. And that's what we see here in the last stage. Coming back to our alpha plume triple point junction, uh, we still do not know what will happen to the African rift. 
uh, in, there are a number of simulations that take into account the uh, movement vectors of the neighboring plates, of the Arabian plate and the African plate and the Somali plate, and also the activity of these, uh, these mid-oceanic ridges in the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and in the neighboring Indian Ocean. These simulations uh, suggest that the Somali plate will not separate from the African plate and that the East African rift will remain an Olacogen. However, we do not know whether what we currently and historically have observed in the plate movement vectors and spreading rates, whether this will hold true for the uh, geological future. And, uh, and therefore, all these are only assumptions on historic data that uh, are very difficult to extrapolate into the future. What we can have a look at are the Olacogens that are related to the breakup of Gondwana, separating North and South America from Europe and from Africa. And when you look here the, at the initial situation, you find here the uh, zone that has become the Atlantic. And at high angle to this uh, Atlantic, to the Atlantic mid-oceanic ridges, we find a number of Olacogens that are uh, that coincide with large uh, rivers in many cases. The Benue and the Niger in Central Africa is an example. The Amazon is another one. The Rio de la Plata here in South America is one. And here we see such an example where a triple point junction actually has developed oceanic basins along all three arms. Because here we see that the um, Southern Atlantic is curving around South America and around the Cape, forming the uh, Indian Ocean. In Europe, we find here the entrance to the Mediterranean, uh, and we find the Biscay as an Olacogen. Also here, the Viking Graben that we already have looked at is, in fact, an Olacogen that is related to the formation of the North Atlantic between Greenland and Scandinavia. Here's the Viking Graben again, and this is what such an Olacogen looks in the uh, cross-section, intense extension of continental lithosphere, but there is no sign of formation of oceanic lithosphere here in this area of the North Sea. This is what an Olacogen would look like before it might get contracted in a later stage of crustal shortening. Fossil Olacogens are pretty well known in the United States. And here we see the various Grand Canyon Olacogen, for instance, the Oklahoma Olacogen, uh, the Mid-Continent Rift. And uh, specifically here, we see that these Olacogens are ending at continental collision zones, like here. You might remember here this area is full of accreted terrains that uh, have been attached in the uh, Mesozoic, essentially, to the western part of the North American plate. Talking about the Western United States, we should uh, not forget to mention metamorphic core complexes. Here in the Basin and Rage province, uh, which is a large extensional uh, province in the uh, central and western United States, going down into Mexico, here we find crustal thinning and the uplift of medium to high grade metamorphic crust from lower levels indicated here in these black spots. These would be the metamorphic core complexes. Let's just have a look at a series of sketches that illustrate how they form. We are starting with the normal uh, simple shear rifting processes with listric faulting and uh, detachment folds at the bottom, rotation of blocks and continuous crustal thinning in our first stages here. Uh, let's see how that carries on with intensified crustal extension. You see here uh, that the listric block folds form such large-scale upwellings with a strong thinning out of the upper brittle crust. And this brings to the surface, by uplift here, a level of metamorphic rocks that uh, have experienced higher temperatures while they were in the lower part of the crust. This might come together with syntectonic granites that uh, form by decompression crustal melting and that are getting involved in the ongoing tectonics into the ongoing extensional tectonics. And that means they are getting sheared 
in their magmatic state. The shearing continues widely, magma crystallizes and cools down, and uh, this is what we typically see in areas where syntectonic granites intrude. We see magmatic deformation patterns, and we see also high temperature solid state deformation. And this heat does not come from the ambient crustal temperature. It comes from the cooling of the granite itself. The uplift is controlled to isostatic uh, force, and uh, this isostatic uplift results from a formerly thickened crust. So these metamorphic core complexes and this uh, rapid uplift of crust you only find when the crust at the onset of deformation, or the onset of such uh, crustal thinning, already was over thickened. You will not find metamorphic core complexes when you stretch a crust of normal thickness. Coming to back arc extension and back arc basins, uh, these features are fairly important structural features. They are closely related to lateral plate movements and to uh, a number of dynamic and physical processes that control whether back arc basins can develop or not. Back arc basins are not only important uh, from the tectonic perspective, they are also economically important, specifically in uh, continental back arc basins. We find the evolution of important base metal deposits. These would be the volcanic hosted massive sulfide deposits. You will hear more about that in your economic geology course. But uh, here, just to mention that uh, continental back arc extension is the preferred setting for such types of uh, VHMS deposits, as we call them. There is a very nice paper that illustrates these uh, processes uh, by Houston and others, uh, 2010 in economic geology. You perhaps should get your hands on a copy of this paper. Very nicely illustrated, very nicely explained. Let's see what happens in such uh, back arc basin situations and why they are conducive to form volcanogenic hosted ore deposits. What you will see is here the uh, subduction of oceanic lithosphere underneath a continental margin. And this triggers a pretty vigorous convection of asthenosphere, of fairly hot asthenosphere, underneath the overriding continental plate. So if such continental back arcs are undergoing such massive heat influx from the vigorously convecting asthenosphere underneath, you will thin out the lithospheric mantle because, uh, remember, the definition for the lithospheric mantle is simply its temperature. The bottom of the lithosphere is the 1280 degrees isotherm. So heat up such a back arc, you will uh, thin out the lithospheric mantle quite substantially. And obviously, heat influx will occur also into the overlying crust that we see here in light gray color. As long as this subduction uh, remains uh, stable in geometry and rate and subduction angle, this convection will persist. And this m might lead to a long-term heat influx into the back arc region. Long-term means it can last for several hundred million years. For several hundred million years, you can have a thin but very hot back arc continental lithosphere. This massive heat influx will trigger magmatic activity. And with the magmatic activity, you will mobilize base metals, which then can form volcanogenic host ore deposits. If such a process is stable and the back arc is neither contracting nor extending, then you will find that here is a fairly high topographic elevation. It is not shown here in this diagram. But the land surface in such an area should not be shallow because uh, the lithosphere is hot, and that allows a thermally supported high topographic elevation. Depending on subduction angle and processes uh, here in the fore arc, we will see that extensional episodes can uh, follow such a stable back arc configuration and extension, then will further thin out the uh, lithosphere here in this region, and it might eventually lead to an oceanic back arc basin and to a separation of the volcanic arc as a continental microplate from the colder craton, which is out of reach of these convection cells and therefore has a thick lithospheric mantle. 
The high temperature and therefore the low shear strength will make such thin and hot back arcs a uh, preferred area of deformation and uh, therefore this uh, the dynamic equilibrium that keeps the back arc stable uh, is easily disturbed either by contractional or by extensional tectonics depending on what is happening here in the fore arc and we will discuss these features and these processes a little bit further. First let's have a look at the kind of rocks that will form uh, either in a submarine environment or underwater or also close to the surface in such back arcs. We see here are the same features that you might observe at the mid-oceanic ridges. Black smokers and the deposition of sulfur rich deposits. These can be sulfide deposits, these also can be sulfates like gypsum. We see here chalcopyrite crystals, crystals you know chalcopyrite is here a copper sulfide, a copper iron sulfide uh, that uh, might even contain precious metals, metals uh, like, like gold. Uh, you will find uh, other sulfides in these areas and, and also here uh, gypsum often forms such crusts that are conspicuous for black smoker environments uh, forming around such hydrothermal vents. At the surface you often find then uh, fairly colorful weathering colors that indicate that there are sulfide rich, uh, uh, typically uh, copper rich environments. Copper staining um, is a feature that is, is very conspicuous in the field. Here we see a schematic description of these uh, economic processes or which is not really the topic of this lecture but uh, just to mention in context with these extensional te tectonics in continental back arcs uh, the metamorphism would be similar to ocean floor metamorphism that uh, means we have convecting hydrothermal, hydrothermal cells which convert the uh, protoliths in this area into uh, low grade metamorphic rocks this is not different from what happens near mid oceanic ridges the sheeted dikes might find their equivalent in continental lithosphere. This example here comes from the oceanic lithosphere, but you can translate that easily into continental crustal situations. The mineral deposits associated with this setting are the VMS copper, iron copper sulfides and iron manganese oxides. Uh, around these hydrothermal vents, ZX deposits, layered intrusions might occur at advanced stages of uh, magma input and if you have such layered intrusions chromium nickel and PGE deposits are not impossible to form. Mount Isa in Australia is such a situation. But let's go back to the tectonics here we see a um, graphical illustration from Debelmas and Muscle and uh, here we see again subduction at a certain angle and this requires a fairly steep subduction angle, will trigger convection in the back arc. And this back arc convection comes from the dragging of a stenospheric mantle following the downgoing slab. This is important because uh, this requires that material that is dragged downwards here in this direction is replaced by other stenosphere. And uh, this necessity to replace a stenospheric material will force other stenospheric material to rise and this rise can lead to the thinning out of the overlying continental lithosphere. Very often we have here some lithospheric mantle left over. This again depends on the temperature of these stenospheric mantle currents uh, that might thermally erode the lithospheric mantle in this region. Uh, here the lithosphere uh, actually means lithospheric mantle because you know the crust is part of the lithosphere and also here is a typo you should uh, ignore this asthenosphere here and uh, spell it correctly. Also here this lithosphere on the left hand side is actually lithospheric mantle as opposed to the crustal part of the lithosphere. The necessity for back arc convection to occur as I said is steep subduction that is the trigger for the initiation of mantle convection in the back arc so the steepness of the downgoing slab is the uh, decisive uh, the decisive factor that uh, is required 
Why do we have sometimes shallow subduction and sometimes steep subduction of oceanic lithosphere? We might go back to our first year lectures. We have mentioned it briefly uh, at uh, first year level that the subduction angle predominantly is controlled by the temperature of the downgoing slab and the temperature in turn is controlled by the age of the oceanic lithosphere. Oceanic lithosphere that uh, has formed at a very distant mid-oceanic ridge will have traveled over a large oceanic basin and while doing so it will have cooled down with increasing age, with increasing time passed since its formation along a mid-oceanic ridge. And such lithosphere, as we see it here, for instance, will undergo steep subduction because it has a higher density. Such lithosphere will dive fairly steeply underneath the continental margin or underneath another oceanic lithosphere that has a lower density because it might be younger. So steep subduction is always related to old, cold, and dense lithosphere. Shallow subduction, as we see it here in the left on the left-hand side, is related to young, hot, and low-density lithosphere. In such a situation, we would expect the mid-oceanic ridge along of which this lithosphere is created not far offshore. The result would be here that this shallow subduction angle prevents convection of a stenospheric mantle here, because simply this mantle wedge here is too narrow to allow convection uh, as a result of dragging along the downgoing uh, oceanic lithosphere. With a steep subduction angle, this is much easier to f facilitate, and you will have here a steep dragging of mantle material downwards. The asthenosphere will follow the steep lithosphere, and that will allow here, not far away from the subduction zone, the rise of hot asthenospheric mantle, which will thermally thin out the lithosphere and promote the formation of what is called a backup basin or also a marginal sea. And the related extensional tectonics will uh, disrupt an overlying once coherent continental plate. Looking at plate movement vectors uh, on Earth today, we can actually figure out where we might find which type of back arc. Clearly here in South America, where we have opposite movement directions of the overriding plate and the subducting Nazca plate, we will find contraction of the continental back arc. This is where we find the thickening of the Andean crust and the formation of the second highest plateau on Earth in this subduction origin. In the Western Pacific, we will have a different situation. Here we have old and cold Pacific oceanic lithosphere subducted underneath the eastern margin of Asia. And uh, the resulting steep subduction angles, they promote extensional back arc spreading. And we find here in the uh, Sea of China such a uh, extensional rim basin, such a back arc basin. Also here uh, in front of the Philippines we find this fairly young oceanic lithosphere that has formed and is in the process of forming uh, and spreading and extension where new oceanic lithosphere is currently produced. The movement vector of Australia here creates a, a very complicated uh, tectonic situation in this region here and in this area you will know there is intense volcanic and seismic activity. This is also reflected in the age distribution, which correlates with temperature in the case of oceanic lithosphere here. We have the highly productive East Pacific rises, uh, forming here the Nazca plate and the, uh, and the Pacific plate. The Pacific plate is extending all the way here and is aging and cooling here. You see the green colors mean uh, this is a fairly old oceanic crust here. Along the ridges, obviously, we have the youngest oceanic crust and lithosphere forming. And uh, here we are subducting this fairly young lithosphere underneath South America at a shallow subduction angle. Here we are subducting a uh, fairly old Pacific lithosphere underneath Eastern Asia. And you see here the red and the yellow spots. This is the young oceanic lithosphere forming by a back arc extension. This is where we have high heat flow. This is where we have young oceanic crust forming behind an island arc. 
Thank you very much for this uh, rather lengthy lecture.